You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. Robert Kaplan's 21st book revolves around what he has learned over the years from Greek philosophers and William Shakespeare. Yale University Press says, quote, Kaplan employs the works of ancient Greeks, Shakespeare, and German philosophers to explore the central subjects of international politics, order, disorder, rebellion, ambition, loyalty to family, and state violence, and the mistakes of power. Mr. Kaplan, 70, was born in New York City and graduated from the University of Connecticut. Robert Kaplan, what advice would you have to someone who has your book, The Tragic Mind, in hand, and they say to you, I don't care about the Greeks, I don't care about the Greek philosophers, I don't care about Shakespeare. Could they still read your book? I think they could. Because, uh, I, you know, the, the aim of the book is to make them care about it to, in order to show how the Greeks are relevant, not only to, um, to our personal lives, but especially to policymaking, to the choices we face. And the same with Shakespeare. They add a depth to it because the questions that the Greeks were posing are the same questions that are being posed now. The Greeks feared chaos. Uh, above all, because they were too rational to deny the power of the irrational that lay, lay on the other side of civilization. That chaos, anarchy is a problem we face in foreign affairs all the time. Shakespeare would have a lot to say about Vladimir Putin, um, because it isn't all maps and geopolitics. A lot has to do with personality and personal demons and, uh, you know, and that, you know, and that really gets to the root of the decision to invade Ukraine uh, back about, uh, you know, I believe it was in uh, 2022, February 2022. Um, so I think they're I think they're very, very relevant. In the early part of your book, you have this sentence. The clinical depression I suffered for years afterward because of my mistake about the Iraq war, led me to write this book. Explain that. Yes. Well, there are a few reasons why I wrote the book. One was that, which I will explain. Another was a close friend of mine who said, you're always writing about you have to think tragically to avoid tragedy. And that would make a good short book to expand upon that. So that was it. But basically, Brian, um, Iraq was not an abstraction for me the way it was for most others in Washington. It was a place I knew intimately. I'd been to Iraq many, quite a number of times since the 1980s. I knew Iran. I knew Saddam Hussein's tyranny intimately. I traveled there alone in the 80s when he was in power. I had my passport confiscated for 10 days by the Iraqi security police. I could not imagine a more oppressive totalitarian climate like Saddam. It was like going back to Stalin's Russia. And I thought to myself, well, what could be worse than this? Nothing can be worse than this. Whatever follows it has to be better in some way or shape or form. And that led me to support the Iraq war. Then I went back to Iraq in 2004, in 2005, embedded with the Marines, 
later embedded with an army striker brigade. And I experienced something that was actually worse than Saddam's tyranny. It was anarchy. It was pure anarchy. Now, tyranny and anarchy are things that have been argued about from Plato to Hobbes for thousands of years. It's a dismal subject. But to learn about it intimately, you know, in person, through your own mistake, has a powerful effect on you. And that in turn helped lead me to go back to the Greeks, to go back to Shakespeare, um, and to do this uh, to do this very short book. In the title, and you mentioned it just a second ago, the tragic mind, the word tragic. What does your word tragic mean? Yes, I mean tragedy differently than people would normally think about it. When most people see the title, they would think, oh, he's a pessimist. Uh, uh, you know, you know, he would think that, oh, tragedy, we experience tragedy in our lives. No, that's not how the Greeks thought of tragedy. Um, the Greeks knew that personal misfortune, uh, family death, divorces, all those kinds of things are the rule of life. Uh, you know, any life lived long enough is going to have a certain amount of this common misfortune. But that's not what the Greeks meant by tragedy. The, what the Greeks meant was something much more sublime. They said not to think tragically is to rob life of its significance. Um, that tragedy meant that it wasn't a battle of it wasn't a matter of evil triumphing over good because that's an easy decision i mean that's easy in fact there's very little about evil in this book in fact that i've written uh tragedy is about one about one good over another good that causes suffering and that's what policymakers have to confront all the time. They have choices put before them. So they all may be bad. Some may be worse than others. Um, you know, it's a matter of one choice which can be morally defended being chosen over another choice which can also be morally defended. And simply by making that choice, a number of people or a large number of people are going to suffer. It's about the imperfections of the world that we live in. It's, you know, the Greeks felt there was something irremediably wrong with the world, but yet at the same time, it was beautiful. And that's what tragedy is about. What countries in the world have you lived in? I've lived in Greece. I've lived How in long Georgia. in Greece? Seven years. What years? Uh, 1982 to 1989. What were you uh, doing then? I was a freelance foreign correspondent. Uh, it's where I started writing for the Atlantic magazine, where, which I would go on to write for 30 years for. Um, and, um, and I lived in Athens. Uh, I got married in Athens. My son was born in Athens. And from Athens, I, I covered the Balkans, this was long before the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. Um, I covered East. I covered the Middle East all the way to Pakistan and the Afghan War. I covered Africa, the Great Ethiopian Famine of 1984-85. Um, Athens was was where I was based in order to roam over this whole area, and it was from Athens that I went to Iraq. Uh, for the first times in the 1980s. I lived in Portugal for two years, um, also uh, covering um, covering this same area. My wife is Portuguese, so we decided to live there for two years. Um, I lived in Israel for four years. Um, and then we moved back to the United States in 1991. Why did you join the Israeli Defense Force? Because I was traveling throughout the Middle East for a number of years, and I settled in Israel, and after three years still staying there, I had to either leave or go into the military. So I went into the military for one year. What'd you do? Nothing particularly interesting. I was at roadblocks. Um, the interesting thing about it was it taught me about realism. Uh, you know, it taught me about how these things are not abstract. 
uh, you know, living in a country that had real enemies all around it made made again, like my experience with Iraq, it made it less abstract. Um, you know, I guess, you know, in a way, my, you know, my career as a foreign correspondent has been against abstraction. Where do you live today? And what else are you doing besides writing books? Yes. Well, uh, for the last quarter century, uh, we've lived in the Berkshires in western Massachusetts, a beautiful area, a few hours from Boston, a few hours from New York. Yet both Boston and New York and Washington are easily accessible um, from the Berkshires. So I'm able to write books to stay to not be as connected as other people are and not as distracted yet at the same time not be a recluse it, 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 you know at, um, at the same time and i travel several months a year reporting speaking um and writing books that's what i do go back to your mention of clinical depression what how, define that and what did it feel like when you were in the middle of it um there are no easy answers for it. Um, I, I would define it by saying waking up in the morning and just being obsessed with your mistakes, you know, with the things that you got wrong, may, may, um, all this, and then forcing yourself to do things. Uh, what I, in the heart of it, I wrote a book, wrote and researched a book called Monsoon, The Indian Ocean and the Future of American Power. Now, this book was researched in um, uh, from about 2006 to 2009. It was published in 2010. And I traveled throughout the Indian Ocean to Muslim countries in many respects. Um, uh, and, and again, heard a lot of grief and criticism of the United States of the Iraq War. But the theme of the book, and which kept me going, which got me out of bed each morning, was that the Indian Ocean would unite with the Western Pacific to be one crisis zone, one one zone of strategy. And this was long before the Pentagon renamed the Pacific Command as the Indo-Pacific Command, which combined both the Indian Ocean and the uh, and the western and the western pacific um it was a very hard book to research it took a lot of energy you know you know reporting and interviewing people in india and pakistan um in um in oman it you know you really needed a lot of energy and it just forced me to work so i kind of worked my way through my depression by researching and writing that book how involved with you were you with advising the Bush administration on going into Iraq. I wrote a number of articles, like many other people did, um, and uh, I attended one meeting. Uh, you know, a group of intellectuals arguing for working with Arab dictators against Iraq. It wasn't about advising for democracy in the region, and saying that since it's obvious that all the intelligence agencies said that Iraq had nuclear weapons. We we advised um, uh, we, we, we advised taking out the regime. That was it. Um, it wasn't what I did per se. It was the fact that with all my experience, all my realism, I got the biggest issue of the age wrong. Why? Because um, I, I got it wrong because I had been obsessed with how horrible Iraq was when I was there. Um, I couldn't imagine anything else. And because you couldn't imagine anything else, you tend to believe the worst thing about the regime. So, all, you know, all these reports from not just the CIA, but intelligence agencies throughout the West, that he was hiding weapons, it was easy to believe if you knew intimately the regime as I did. Do you have any idea how this country with its multi multi billions of dollars spent on intelligence would come up with the this the uh what they said at the time was the fact that there was weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. How do how did we do that? Um I think there's been a very interesting book published about that just in recent months by a celebrated University of Virginia historian Melvin Leffler. 
called Confronting Saddam Hussein. And he spent about a decade researching this book, just researching the pro- the bureaucratic process of decision making that led to uh, uh, President George W. Bush to uh, to give the signal to invade. And he said it was a combination of absolute fear humiliation and hubris you know the humiliation that this was a republican administration and yet 9 11 had happened on its watch you know the republicans were supposed to be the tough guys on foreign policy at that point who had protected the united states at that point the reagan administration the elder bush administration eisenhower etc it was this this sheer humiliation and obsession therefore, of not getting it wrong again. You, uh, you know, so there was a sense that you couldn't take any chances. That I think that was the mentality. And I'm just, um, you know, you, you know, I'm just um, theorizing here. You know, that was the mentality that led to the decision we, we can't, cannot take a chance. This was uh, let me take that back. It's not me theorizing. It's basically how Leffler, the historian Leffler, explained explained it. Why did you decide to accept uh, an appointment to the Defense Policy Board at the Pentagon? Yes, this was two thousand and nine. This was, um, you know, this was my six years after Iraq. Um, I was asked to join the board because the whole purpose of the see the defense policy board is a group that meets a few times a year of people who are not in power, not in bureaucratic power. Some of them could be ex, uh, ex you know, people with government experience. Of, you know, quite a few of them are academics with no government experience. The point of the defense policy board is to get the secretary of defense outside the bubble to essentially meet with people and to, you know, let his hair down about some of the things he or she is struggling with. Um, and to talk to people who are not in government, who have no stake in the, in, have no bureaucratic stake in the decisions being made and can just give him honest advice. Um, so I served on the board for a year and a half. Uh, secretary, the secretary at the time was Robert Gates. And um, and this was when Obama was president. So I served on the board when Obama was president. And I took it because I thought that, you know, that the secretary that could benefit from someone with my experience, you know, someone who who hadn't been in government, but had been a foreign correspondent and had made mistakes and was somewhat humble in that respect. And uh, I remember very closely a discussion we had about the Arab Spring, uh, where um, uh, this, you know, where um, I said that the Arab Spring started off successfully in Tunisia, um, but once and and Egypt, but once it got to countries that were more artificially created with ethnic and sectarian differences, like Libya and Syria and Yemen, it could become very, very anarchic you know, very violent and anarchic, which is what happened. I want to read a sentence, and I want to parse it a little bit in your book. It's at the end. It's in the acknowledgments, the first paragraph. General inspiration came. We're talking about this book. General inspiration came from the late Charles Hill of Yale, to whose eclectic mind I was exposed at numerous dinners over decades at Henry Kissinger's weekend house in Kent, Connecticut. First of all, who's Charles Hill? Charles Hill died um, two years ago. He was for, he had been George Schultz's executive assistant at the State Department, and then he spent his career teaching at Yale. And he was he was Charlie Hill was one of the last of the great generalists. You know, we live in a world now where everyone's a specialist. You know, every you know, you just see this with the think tanks, with the articles being published in foreign policy, foreign affairs. Everyone has a specialty. Uh, When something happens anywhere, they get a specialist to write about it. 
Charlie Hill was a real generalist. He could discuss Iraq. He could discuss the Middle East or China. Um, he could discuss Jack Kerouac. He was just and and as a result of being a great generalist, he had a real eclectic mind and was a great teacher. Um, you know, uh, you know, he's you know, he's legendary among the students of Yale of being a, a great teacher. And um, and he w- and and he had published a book, I believe, in 2010, thereabouts called Grand Strategies. You know, and it was about um, the great works of literature being used to improve statesmanship. And, it, you know, every once in a while, a book is published that you're jealous about. You're saying, I should have written that book. You know, a book was published a few years ago on Joseph Conrad. And I said, I should, I, w- I would have liked to have written that book. Um, so Charlie's book, Grand Strategies, made me a little jealous. And he said, well, you could write a similar book sometime, maybe. And in a way, The Tragic Mind is a kind of analog of, of Charlie's book, because it takes Great, you know, great literature, in this case, the Greek Shakespeare and the moderns like Conrad and Dostoevsky and others, and um, and applies it to decision making. This book is published by Yale uh, Press. Is does that have anything to do with your connection with Charles Hill? Uh, no, no. It was just that Yale University Press, you know, it's one of the top two or three university presses. And though all my other books are published by Random House, this was not a trade book, so to speak. Um, you know, it was not a commercial book, so to speak. So, And it was very short. It was very different. So it was appropriate that it, so we went to like the best university press and Yale took it. And it's only about 135 pages, so which is unusual yes, today. Yeah, it, yes, it is. It's more like a, a lo- an extended essay. It's more like a you know a long extended essay. The second part of this first sentence, uh, I'd ask you to further explain. It, numerous dinners over the decades at Henry Kissinger's weekend house in Kent, Connecticut. Why? Why were you there? Um, because um, Dr. Kissinger and I became friends at, at about 25 years ago. And uh, it's, it's several times a year, maybe four or five times a year, my wife and I were invited to his house, his weekend house in Kent, and um, where he had people, you know, thinkers, you know, you know, you know, writers, thinkers, not all of whom who agreed with him, you know, it was, a, and there, there would, you know, and over dinner, there would be a policy discussion of some sort. When someone came in from Singapore, the Singaporean prime minister, or someone came in from Germany, for instance, uh, a high official in the German government or something, he would host a dinner in their honor and he would invite, you know, 12, 14 people. As you know, there are a lot of people in this country that don't like him. They don't trust him. They don't. They remember Vietnam. What would you say uh, to those people about why you spent so much time around Henry Kissinger? What I what I would say is that Henry Kissinger, oh, you know, moved closer to China in a very secret way because that was the only time, the only way that the U.S. could approach. China, because had their bureaucracies gotten involved at the middle levels, it never would have come off. It had to be done initially secretly. And he moved closer to China in order to balance against the Soviet Union and at the same time achieve detente with the Soviet Union. At the same time, he and President Nixon withdrew more troops from Vietnam in a quicker period of time than de Gaulle withdrew from Algeria, um, and for which de Gaulle is lionized by historians. Uh, Remember, they had inherited over half a million troops on the ground in Vietnam, and within three years they were gone. This says nothing about the diplom the you know the brilliant diplomacy he engineered in the Middle East, which restored diplomatic relations between the US the US and Egypt, the US and Syria, 
um, splitting Egypt off from Syria at the end of the uh, at the end of the 1973 Middle East War. Um, and and this has been exposed in a brilliant new book by um, uh, 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 you know he's, you know I'm having a brain freeze for a moment. <laughs> uh, you know, um, um, Bring it up later. Uh, if you... a, 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 a brilliant new book. Um, you know, using all these declassified documents, um, you know, uh, uh, about it. So I think Kissinger has a rather good record, a record that will stand the test of time. Um, you know, to read his book on China, and, you know, this is an age when so many books are ghostwritten, yet I can hear his voice on every page, you know, literally. Um, to read his book on China and hear him analyze his conversations with Mao and Joe, with Zhou Enlai, with Jiang Zemin, with Hu Jintao and others, is I have no doubt that with all his faults and all the library of books written against him, that he will be remembered as a significant statesman of the 20th century. For the moment, a little sidebar, Kent, Connecticut is located where? It's in northwestern Connecticut, nor kind of central northwestern Connecticut. Um, it's about a 90-minute drive from where I live. It's in the countryside. It's very beautiful. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's very secluded, very beautiful area. What kind of a house is it? Very understated. Um, very simple New England house with a, a fair amount of property. Um, it's that's how I would call it. You know, it's obviously an expensive house, but it's very understated. So, what would an, a weekend at his house or an evening at his house be like? Well, it was an evening, not a weekend. You know, you know, others were invited for weekends. You know, others who came from from far away. And uh, oh, the author's name was Martin Indick. Who wrote the book on K called um, called um, you know you know you know the master of the game Kissinger in the Middle East who spent years Martin. at the Brookings, right? Martin Indyk, that was my brain. Okay, uh, okay. Um, and uh, go back to the you, Kissinger entertainment evening and the discussion. How'd that work? Right. Yeah, we, you know, you'd arrive about seven in the evening. You would talk over drinks for about 45 minutes. And it was always serious talk. There was no small talk. You know, it, it was like work, you know, you know, you know, think of it that way. It was like very much you were there to discuss issues, you know, um, and uh, and then you would all go into dinner around the round, you know, a large round table. Uh, and the discussion would continue and he would he would kind of interject and s interject and set the, um, the you know, you know, set the theme for the discussion. Um, and uh, uh, and and it would go on through dessert. Then we would retreat back to the living room with more discussion and it would last about three and a half hours, the whole thing. Did you ever take notes after this was over on those? No, emails? I didn't. Sometimes I did, but uh, I, I, perhaps I should have, but I didn't. I wasn't conscious of I'm going to use this for some future event. I, you know, I've written two long essays on Kissinger, one before we knew each other at all. Um, in 1990 this was in 1999 just before we met it was about his first book a world restored about metternich and the congress of vienna and then in 2013 i published a long essay defending his career in the atlantic it was sort of meant to be sort of a 90th birthday obituary kind of thing and uh, and it was pub but besides those two pieces, I haven't written about him because I feel that others have written about him much more expertly than me. Um, Barry Gouin, former longtime nonfiction editor at The New York Times Book Review, wrote a brilliant book on Kissinger, The Inevitability of Tragedy. And then there's Neil Ferguson's first volume, Kissinger, The Idealist, which takes it from his birth to when he became national security advisor, which is also very voluminous and I think very, very well done. 
As I was reading your book, I constantly noticed one word <clears throat> that you used and one theme, and I've written all those down separately, and I'm going to take you through them step by step, and you can fill in the blanks of anything you want from your book or what you're thinking. I'll just read you back the first one. Quote, the Washington elite pays too small a price for them. We're talking about foreign policy disasters. And this, in turn, allows the policy elite to shrug them off and go on just as before, unquote. What are you, what are you saying there beyond the obvious? Well, um, even democracies require elites. You know, in any way... Rule any any seriously governed country, there is an elite. Um, in democracy, it can be meritocratic. In aut- autocratic, it could be by connections with the ruler. In monarchy, it could be you know someone with royal lineage. You know, elites form. Elites are the only way you establish hierarchy, and hierarchy is necessary to avoid anarchy. Uh, you know, you know, the, you know, the um, the opposite of anarchy is not tyranny. It's hierarchy, according to um, great late Columbia University professor Kenneth Waltz. Um, and what I'm saying is America is an enormously blessed power. It has two oceans on each side of it. It has the largest internal navigable river system in the world, which allowed for an economy of scale to take root in the 19th century. It's so blessed. Uh, what's to the north? Middle class Canadians. You know, you know, the only pro the only geographical challenge is with the south, with the uh, Mexican with the Mexican border. But that's actually small compared to like Europe's challenges with Russia or or North Africa, or China's challenges with enemies all around. In other words, the point I'm, I'm going to make is that because America is so well blessed in, you know, with natural resources, etc., it can afford to make big mistakes like Vietnam and uh, a generation and a half later, Viet, uh, Iraq, and you know with afghanistan you know mixed in and there's and and basically shrug it off whereas smaller countries not so well geographically blessed it could be catastrophic um so what i'm saying is we do vietnam we do iraq and relative to other countries and other big you know big foreign policy mistakes you know the you know too small a price is paid and that leads to what i write in the book to a certain amount of decadence you know people you know you know people can just rationalize away their mistakes or not even mention them or not even deal with them and just go on uh you know mistakes are easy to make foreign policy is full of many many mistakes um but, you know, it's hard to get things right because we don't, you know, you know, because our influence around the world, even with all of our power, is still limited compared to local influences, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, in the area. But it's the very power and blessedness, you know, in terms of natural resources and geographical position that allows America to shrug off these mistakes. Number two, and these do jump around in the book, but um, and I know you'll be able to pick up where they come from. Number two, you're talking about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Quote, it laid bare a stark truth that 20 years of posturing by policy elites and intellectuals could not mask, colon, the Afghan state and military were fiction. And then a little bit later you say, we had built nothing. Yeah, because look, what were the reasons? Well, we initially went into Afghanistan in October 2001, and we toppled the regime with a minimum amount of force relying on local allies. And that was creative, inventive, and a success. But what followed, as I explained, was the intervention of big bureaucratic army. You know, with its, you know, with its many layers of bureaucracy building massive bases um, on a country 
with um, relatively low literacy rates, divided by mountains, um, you know, low education rates, uh, a very thin historical background of being a cohesive bureaucratic state at all. And we just layered this big army on top of it. And the goal was we were going to bring democracy to, uh, to Afghanistan. We were going to make it a strong state. Um, and, uh, uh, and we were going to make it an American ally. And none of those things were achievable. You know, they weren't, you know, they weren't achieved. And throughout the 2010, the 2000s, throughout the 2010s, we kept hearing that we were making progress and people wrote opinion pieces that we were making progress. And it turned out that when push came to shove and we left, there was nothing there. You know, nothing that lasted more than a few days or weeks at the most. Next, rebels are beloved by literary, artistic, and journalistic elites. They can do no wrong since they uphold ideals without the burden of bureaucratic responsibility. Yes. Um, Albert Camus, who I write about in the book, wrote a book, perhaps his greatest book, The Rebel, uh, or Rebels. Uh, and in it, he says that the rebel has a, has a moral responsibility, that people have revolted against central authority ever since Prometheus revolted against Zeus in, in the deserts of Scythia. Um, and, but revolting against bureaucratic authority is easy. You know, it's it's morally satisfying, but it's analytically easy. Uh, the hard part is what are you going to replace it with? You know, you know, to revolt against bureaucratic authority is OK. I mean, is is just one part of it. But if you destroy a system, um, as we did in Iraq, um, um, and you don't have a fully laid out plan to, uh, you know, or, you, you know, in order to recreate a better system, a system that's maybe less harsh, less cruel, more efficient, then the, re then the rebel, as Camus explains it, um, basically says that the, the rebel is morally wanting. You know, it, it, you know, you know, it could be, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, and that's the point, you know, the the point is that 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 writers, journalists, it's 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 you know, as I said, it's it, it's emotionally satisfying and morally necessary to support you know to support those who would rise up against the dictatorial regime. But it's analytically easy because then you have to ask the question: What will replace it? What is capable of replacing it? Do you have a plan to replace it? And this is what happened in Libya, you know, in Syria, in Yemen. Remember the civil war in Yemen, where uh, where people on the op-ed pages beat up against the Saudis began as the Arab Spring in 2011. Uh, Yemen had a very capable ruler, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who ruled Yemen for 30 years with a minimum of cruelty, basically, as he called it, dancing on the heads of snakes, you know, maneuvering between the various tribes. And he was toppled partly by pressure from the West because he was not democratically elected. The state collapsed, it fell apart, it fell into civil war, and then you got the Saudi and Iranian interventions. Next, among the elites, there is much virtue signaling about the poor and vocal concern for human rights is a necessary tool of professional advancement in the high social echelons. Explain. Yeah, you, yeah I, 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 you know, this was something I was exposed to at Davos, at, at, you know, at other international forums, where, it, you know, people talk often about, you know, ending autocracy, um, you, know, you know, supporting human rights. This is all wonderful. And this may actually succeed in work in Ukraine. You know, you know, uh, because now we're talking about Europe and uh, and Europe is a place that is ready for democracy. And therefore, the states that are not democratic, like Belarus and Russia, um, are uh, are disasters, you know, um, 
But when you talk about it, you know, in, in much of the other part of the world, it avoids the tough questions, which, which are that, um, that neither the, um, the, the pro-democracy demonstrators in the streets nor the autocrats in power have the, bu- have the bureaucratic experience or the analytical discipline to run a well-functioning state that is not, uh, you know, that is not overly oppressive. We've seen this in Sudan. That's the most recent example where, uh, uh, you know, where we had been promoting a democratic alternative and it exploded in our faces. The disturbing, this is your, from your book, the disturbing rumblings by which the working poor periodically prepare to throw bricks through the window of the elite world and to which the elite are blind until they are hit in the face. Yeah, I, I think later on in that sentence, I use Trump as an example. I use, you know, that the election of Donald Trump in 2016 was an example of, uh, you know, was an example of a number of things. Um, uh, But one thing it was an example of that doesn't get written about too much. It was a revolt against the elites uh, 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 because, you know, Trump is a man of no personal dignity, uh, of no refinement. Um, um, so why are people voting for him? You know, you know, he's a classic demagogue populist. Why are people voting for him? Well, there are a whole number of reasons. But one of the reasons is a revolt against the elites. And one of the one great American uh, English writer who I who I quote in dealing with all this is Henry James in, in The Tragic Mind, where Henry James wrote a book, The Princess Casamassima, which he got inspired to write by walking the streets of London late into the night um, and seeing all the poverty, all the despair. And he was just coming back from some refined dinner party. Or uh, um, or something, and so this refined, um, brilliant writer got it into his head that um, there's a lot going on just beneath the surface that the people I go to dinner parties with don't experience and don't understand, and that's what inspired him to write a book about essentially a terrorist. But from the terrorist point of view, all the horrible things that happened to him in the course of his life that led him to become mixed up with a group of anarchists, essentially. Next quote. The current policy elite, by contrast, comprises the most physically and financially secure generation in American history. Yeah, um, you know, financially secure in the sense that they come, most of them come from the middle classes or upper middle class, and physically secure because even in World War II, America was the only country that did not have its infrastructure severely damaged. The World War II was not fought on American soil. The last war fought on American soil was the Civil War. Um, uh, you know, it, you know, when you ask Russians who won World War Two, they said we did, not the Americans, because, you know, we suffered 20 million casualties and the Americans about 600,000. We paid the blood price, not you. Um, and um, and so, you know, it is an elite that has not been physically, you know, for the most part, you know, there are are always individuals who are who you know for the most part have not been uh not been threatened physically or not threatened financially um you know i you know it's interesting that uh some of the the comments i've heard about this book that were most supportive came from foreign correspondents who had experienced upheavals and and anarchy in places in the developing world and knew exactly what I was talking about. You know, one point I want to make about the Greeks is, as I said earlier, the Greeks were too rational to not not to deny the power of the irrational that lay on the other side of civilization. So the Greeks knew that the greatest threat not was not tyranny, it was anarchy, you know, and 
uh, you know, elites have a lot of experience about tyranny because dictators are in the news all the time. And, you know, and dictators threaten a free exchange of ideas and elites are about discussing brilliantly ideas. But elites, as I put it in the book, have relatively little experience with anarchy. They've never been held up at a roadblock, you know, in a develop, you know, out in the bush in a developing country. They've never experienced. They've never. They they've never experienced what Iraq was really like after Saddam was toppled, or some such thing as that. Back to your friend, Doctor Kissinger. You say in the book, Henry Kissinger once quipped. American elites are unique in their disdain for realism and realists. What's that mean? Well, first of all, Kissinger would actually have fun with that. He would say, well, I'm not a realist. You know, what he meant is he's a realist like George Schultz was or James Baker was a realist internationalist. You know, who, you know, who played geopolitics, but also understood the great role of personalities of Shakespeare in in politics. Realism today is thought of as neo isolationism in a way. So the definitions have gotten confused and changed so much. But what he meant was that in all other times, in all other countries, especially in Europe, um, real, you know, realists were held up as the ultimate, you know, sophisticated, logical people. And in America, you know, people were either liberal internationalists um, or neoconservatives. And neoconservatism was really a form of liberal internationalism. It's often, you know, used as a critique. But, it, you know, w- what it really is, is a form of, a, you know, of, of liberal internationalism. One last quote. Uh, revolving around the threat, I'm, I assume you've figured out by now, to believe that the power of the United States can always right the world is a violation of the tragic sense of, uh, sensibility. And yet significant elements of our foreign policy elite in Washington have subscribed to this notion. Yes. In the first chapter, I say that geopolitics is ultimately pessimistic. It's very, you know, in in and of itself, it's very lowering. Um, you know, it's just about billiard balls hitting each other on a pool table, countries interacting, whereas policy, by definition, is idealistic and optimistic, because the policy practitioner has to believe he can improve the world simply by engaging in policy. And in the United States, that sometimes goes too far where there's this assumption that, you know, the, the history and conditions of, of, of Libya are less important to Libya than America's own experience with democracy that we can export to Libya. And you could use that same example with Sudan, with Iraq, with Syria, with Afghanistan. It's that our history is more important than their history. Our experience is more important than their experience. And, um, you know, and I'm and, and to me, that's actually a form of isolationism, even though it goes under the under the rubric of idealism, because it's assuming that your country has all the answers, that the history of your country is basically can be applied to any place in the world. And it cannot be. How much would the word elite describe you? Um. It would describe me pretty well. After all, I write books. I'm on this show with you. Um, I'm, uh, you, you know, I've engaged with, uh, with with people in Washington. It's a form of self criticism in a way. And how about Henry Kissinger and Charles Hill, for that matter? Are they elites? Yes, but remember Kissinger's Kissinger's uh, significance, his brilliance. I would say is not just because of his mind. It's because he grew up in Nazi Germany as, a, you know, as a Jewish youngster and had searing memories of it and then lived in difficult circumstances with an immigrant family in New York City. He served in the U.S. Army 
He had seen violent conflict at the end of World War II. I believe, I believe this comes from Neil Ferguson's book. He was sort of the de facto mayor of an occupied German town after, you know, at, um, after the May 8th, 1945 surrender, because he spoke fluent German and he was therefore very useful for the U.S. military. So he had real experience in life that elites do not have. You take that and you put it together with his mind um, and his ability to see both, ge you know, mathematical geopolitics, but also the Shakespearean peculiarities of various world leaders like Anwar Sadat or Zhou Enlai, and you get what he what he is. At, at what time in your life did you have an experience that most elites would not have? Uh, I can give you some. Um, in 1993, I hitchhiked from Freetown, Sierra Leone, um, across Sierra Leone into the center of the country in a place called Bo, uh, capital B as in boy, O. And once I left Freetown, the government stopped existing. Um, and and every few miles, I hit a. I was you know hitchhiking in a truck or or, or a car. There would be soldiers with their safeties off their their assault rifles, um, and they would you know they would ask you a lot of questions. Uh, they would in a very subtle way threaten you, and then they would let you go on. And you saw the fragility, the fragility of society, um, very very much so. Um, it was also in Pakistan, on the northwest frontier of Pakistan, where the government officially ruled, but actually you encountered uh, armed tribal militias that were not in any way controlled by the government, though you were technically inside Pakistani territory. What about the closest you've come to seeing war? The, I mean, you write about it in the book, the dirt of war, the fear of war. Where were you when you came closest to this experience? I was in Fallujah with the uh, first battalion of the third Marine uh, of the fifth Marines. This was a, the first early days of April uh, 2004. And due to a series of decisions made by the Bush administration, it was decided that the Marines would capture Fallujah from various rebel groups. And I experienced for about three or four days uh, close quarters, urban combat, and I was terrified the whole time. It, you know, it was three or four days, but it seemed like three or four years. Anyone who says they're brave while experiencing combat, I, I, I distrust. Um, yeah, I think, you know, people are, t you know, the only human reaction is terror, you know, you know, you know, in that sense. The Marines obviously handled it well because they're Marines. They're well trained. I, I was not. You say in your book, in the minds of the commentariat, quite a few of whom have many degrees and too little life experience, was was it made it made light of I'm, I'm misreading this um, in the minds of the commentary quite a few of whom have many degrees and to too little life experience is made light have, I'm still not getting it right made light every year they make like every year becomes 1939 and every adversary is Hitler that's the point I wanted to get to what are you saying there yeah that's too easy I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the book, I say that the point is to uh, respect and husband fear, but not to be immobilized by fear, because appeasement 1938 was about being immobilized by fear. But we tend to overuse that analogy, you know, in, you know too much. You know, every so what I'm saying is every dictator is not. Adolf Hitler, every foreign crisis is not 1939 or, or 1938, um, and that it's too easy to fall back on a single analogy, because in many instances, we have to make, um, you know, we, you know we, we lack the ability to, uh, to have our way, 
and it would be too expensive. Uh, the public would not support us to totally have our way. Um, I think that one, you know, and um, so it's, you know, you have to be careful not to overlearn an analogy. And I feel that, you know, as I wrote in, in that passage, that um, that declaring every every situation like 1939 um, does that. Um, also, but the an- analogy still works because, um, again, we don't we, we don't over we, we cannot we can overlearn a lesson in the other way of just shrugging off every autocratic challenge and doing nothing. That's wrong too. Up front in the book. You have two quotes uh, as you open the book to begin to read it. The first one is from E.M. Forster, The Longest Journey, 1907. And the quote is, ah, the frailty of joy. We are none of we we are none of us safe. Why did you pick that to begin the book? Um, Because um, one of the lessons of the Greeks is that the worst tragedy, the worst thing can befall the most charmed and wealthy and successful among us in any on any given day. That's the story of Oedipus. Oedipus was the king of Thebes. He had everything. He had wealth. He had honor. And yet within 24 hours, his life is destroyed. Um, So my point is that and therefore, because anything can happen to any of us on any given day, Arrogance is a form of idiocy. Second quote from Graham Greene, 1960. Fear saves us from so many things. Yes. um, To be fearful, we apply this in our lives all the time. You know, we worst case scenario, we worry. uh, We say, you know, we say, well, what if I do this? What are the bad things that can happen? You know, you know, what if I take this job? How could it go wrong before I decide to take it? You know, so we do this in our daily lives all the time. And one of and 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 one of the things I'm trying to uh, to show is that, you know, this this is also how decision making should be made. And, you know, if I could add something here, I would say that so far, at least. I think the Biden administration has handled the war in Ukraine very well. On the one hand, it's provided tens of billions of dollars in in, in military and other aid to the Ukrainians. The greatest demonstration of American power since the first Gulf War um, of 1991, but has done so without any American troops constantly in fear of the war spreading to NATO, constantly in fear and, you know, worrying about Putin using weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, nuclear. I think it's gotten this balance. And that's what I'm talking about in the book. You know, the whole book is a balance between um, between your between having fears, but not being immobilized by them at the same time. If someone is not a follower of Shakespeare or a follower of the Greeks, which one Shakespeare book or or play would you recommend somebody go to to study to try to understand Shakespeare? Um, I, I think the most accessible, you know, in a way the easiest to read is Macbeth, because a lot happens very quickly in a relatively short play. And one of the lessons of Macbeth is that when you decide to do something really dangerous or maybe bad, and the actual doing of it uh, in between can be an ocean, can be a lifetime. You know, Hamlet ruminating in the course of a whole play about what to do. But in Macbeth, things happen quickly. That's why it's exciting. But they happen quickly because Macbeth and his wife don't think this way you know between them between getting an idea to do something violent and actually doing it is a very short step whereas for most people it's a very big step you know in the you know it you know in in in, with most people it's you know it can take ages you know and they may never take that next step so shake so macbeth is a is an example of a play where that is absent 
well, you know, where the protagonists, you know, do not evaluate the um, the significance of what they are doing. And uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, there are more. Which one of the Greek philosophers, again, would you read if you had to pick one to start your uh, your entrance into that field? Um, I would take um, uh, Euripides um, and um, Iphigenia at Aulis, where King Agamemnon, the tribal leader of the Greeks, has to make a terrible decision. There's no wind for his navy to cross to fight Troy. And the soothsayers, the, uh, his advisors are saying, the gods are angry with you. The only way to get wind, to get the wind is to, um, is to sacrifice your daughter, Iphigenia. And, and, and Agamemnon said, and if I don't do that, and then, uh, you know, he asked an advisor, and, and, and the answer is, will, men re- will, the na- will, will, will the military revolt against me? And the answer is yes. You know, men past numbering will revolt against you. So what's significant about this play is the horror of leadership. You know, you're in power. You dominate everyone. Officially, you're the most successful person imaginable. But your choices are awful. You know, your choices are absolutely awful. Between doing nothing, not sacrificing your daughter, and losing power and perhaps your life and your family's life, or sacrificing your daughter. And um, and Agamemnon becomes one of the most miserable people in Greek tragedy because he faces this choice. And this is the Greeks telling us that don't envy people in power because their lives are far more difficult than you could ever imagine because of the decisions that they have to make. Robert Kaplan, do you have uh, a book you're already working on? <clears throat> the next, one? I have a book coming out in August called The Loom of Time Between Empire and Anarchy from the Mediterranean to China. And it's a work of reporting of reflection over 50 years in the greater Middle East. And it's a uh, yeah, it's much different from this book. It's a big book. It's full of interviews with people on the record throughout the Middle East. The name of the book we've been talking about is The Tragic Mind, subtitled Fear, Fate, and the Burden of Power. And our guest is Robert D. Kaplan. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.